gives us immense pleasure that we are organizing this first time this seminar legal awareness program along with the Smitha Law College. I thank you to the principal H.S. George sir and also our uh, speaker Praveen Paldesai and the uh, Ethel Karanji sir. I also uh, uh, happy that Kishore Tiwari sir is in charge of this program. Uh, uh, our Darsya Hamdartha is a charitable trust engaged in a number of philanthropic uh, activity which uh, includes free legal aid to deserving needy persons and in particular to persons languishing in prison. Creation of legal awareness is one of our main object with reference to right of uh, people as well as social obligations. Carrying out the campaign to bring about reform in the legal structure including legislative initiatives. Uh, in Maharashtra, I will uh, particularly concentrate about the Maharashtra. We got the uh, got the permission uh, to visit the work uh, in all over the jails of Maharashtra. That is, there. in Maharashtra there are 26 jails. We got the permission uh, to work in 26 jails and to help the needy people. Presently, our team is uh, uh, very uh, good working in Baikala Jail, Irwada Jail, Pune, Kalya, Nasik Jail, and Thane Jail, as well as Busawal Jails. Uh, our work is very good uh, in these jails and inmates are getting the bails and uh, we are also helping them by the plea bargaining uh, everyone is aware that uh, recently also the supreme court has issued the guidelines about the plea bargaining and so we are uh, also helping them to come out of uh, the jail uh, by using the weapon of plea bargaining and also we are also conducting the trials <clears throat> We are conducting various programs for legal awareness and our volunteers have taken various issues and raised the various ways. The recent, you will see, the recent, uh, recently the state of Maharashtra have issued the one circular that the in POSCO cases, the FIR should not be registered. We have raised the wise and we took up this matter up to the high level and finally the state of Maharashtra and the uh, police authority have withdrawn that uh, circular and now uh, FIR can be straight away be filed in the police station in case of the POSCO case. Everyone knows that the POSCO cases is very sensitive in nature. So this type of the issues also we are um, taking up in the interest of the public at large. We are getting excellent response from the judges, magistrate, jail staff and police in these works. Though I'm using the word uh, response, uh, it is not proper to use the word response when uh, when our organization, especially the Darse Andar is working working for the people's pain, dirt. So the word response is very uh, narrow, narrow minded in this. So therefore we are really committed that when we, uh, it is our aim and objective that when we visit to the jails, there will not be any response at all. And everyone will get the legal aid. Uh, after, uh, after uh, now we are in the 75th uh, independence date and we will see the uh, our situation still we are uh, very ba back for providing the legal aids. Even our, uh, even our honorable Chief Justice of India, you will let this uh, time and again requesting everyone to be part of the legal aid initiatives, uh, initiatives so that the poor and needy people should get the justice. I would I would like to uh, quote why the uh, why the people uh, people participation NGOs participation is necessary for the legal work legal aid and uh, if, if you will see there is a legal service authority act 1987 so in the morning when I was speaking with the uh, Keshav Tiwari sir so he said no there is a legal service authority act 1987 so how you will help in the people so though there is a legal service authority act but anything which is uh, without people's participation uh, non government organization participation it's uh, not perfect if we have to achieve uh, the our dream that there way everyone should get the justice free access and whatever uh, has been in uh, incorporated in our constitution in that case everyone's participation is necessary for that i would like to quote justice p n bhagwati in the center for legal research versus state of kerala while during the, uh, delivering the judgment, uh, Bhagavati Chief Justice stated that the writ petition raised a question as to whether voluntary organization or engage in the legal aid program should be supported by the state government. And if so, what extent and what conditions? So, uh, Justice Bhagavati, uh, 30, uh, 35 years back, whatever I have uh, quoted in his judgment, I'm just quoting, and then you will realize after the 35 years of um, this judgment, and even after 75 hours of uh, our independence, why the legal aid uh, necessary and why the uh, NGOs like the say under the, uh, our participation is necessary. I'm just quoting his judgment and I will conclude it. There can be no doubt that if legal aid program is to succeed, it must involve public participation. The state government undoubtedly has an obligation under Article 39A of the Constitution, which embodies a directive principle of, principle of the state policies. 
to set up a comprehensive and effective legal aid program in a, in order to ensure that the operation of the legal system promote justice on the basis of equality but we have no doubt that despite the sense of social commitment which animates many of our officer in the administration no legal aid program can succeed in reaching the people if its operation remains confined in the hands of administration it is absolutely essential that people should be involved in legal aid program because the legal aid program is not charity or bounty but it is a social entitlement of the people and those in need of the legal assistance cannot be looked upon as a mere beneficiary of the legal aid program but they should be regarded as participant in it it's very nice quote if we want to secure people's participation and involvement in the legal aid program we think the best way of securing it is to operate through voluntary organization and social action group these organizations are working amongst the deprived and vulnerable section of the community at the grassroots level and they know what are the problems and difficulty encountered encountered by the neglected section of indian humanity it is now acknowledged throughout the country that the legal aid program which is needed for the purpose of reaching social justice to the people cannot afford to remain confined to the traditional or litigation oriented legal aid program but it must taking into the account the social economic conditions prevailing in the country adopt a more dynamic postures and take within its sweeps what we may call strategic legal aid program camps encouragement of public interest litigation and holding of lok adalas or niti melas from bringing about settlements of the dispute whether pending in the courts or outside the assistance of the voluntary agency and social action group must therefore be taken by the state for the purpose of operating the legal uh, legal aid program in the widest and most comprehensive sense and this is an obligation which flows directly from article 39a of the constitution it also necessary to lay down norms which should guide the state in lending its encouragement and support to voluntary organization and social action group in operating legal aid program and or, uh, and organizing legal aid camps and lok adalat or niti melas we are of the view that following norms should provide sufficient guidance to the state in this via and we direct the state government shall in compliance with the obligation under article 39a of the constitution extended cooperation and support of the following categories of voluntary organization and social action groups in running the legal aid program and organization legal aid camps and lok adalat or niti mela this is what is been stated by the justice p n bhagwat in the judgment that uh, the role of the non organ uh, ngos and the action groups is very necessary and uh, and therefore we are also doing the same work what is been justice bhagwat has stated long back in this background it is my humble request that everyone including youngster senior and junior must be part of this noble work a uh, global uh, noble work uh, to conclude my session i would like to quote uh, atal ji uh, atal bihari vajpayee our former prime minister was we have stated very uh, good thing about the how is the life of the uh, life of a person should uh, person should live li life to manushya jeevan anmol nidhi hai punya ka prasad hai hum keval apne ke liye na jiye auron ke liye bhi jiye jeevan jeevan kala hai vigyan hai dono ka samanvay avashyak hai thank you very much i would like that everyone should be a part of this noble profession dhanyawad uh thank you very much uh, ravindra sir for your uh, enlightening words now i take this opportunity to introduce the speaker for the day it is my uh, uh, pleasure that i have been given this opportunity to introduce the speaker so i will go with the first speaker advocate uh, pravin uh, faldesai sir now uh, thank you very much sir for taking out the time and uh, giving us your precious time and we are sure that we and our students will be benefited by this i'll just take a minute or so to introduce the speaker although he has a very long profile but i will cut short because we have a time constraint uh, uh, faldesai sir is uh, at present a uh, deputy solicitor general of india he is also the public prosecutor um, high court of uh, state of goa as well as an additional government advocate uh sir has done his schooling from uh, st teresa of jesus high school uh, goa and he has completed his law from vm salgaonkar college which is in panjim he was enrolled at at bar in 2004 he initially started his practice with one of a senior law, lawyer mr sd lotlekar and uh, from 2004 to 2007 he was practicing with him and after 2007 he started his own independent <laughs> practice he is at presently uh, based out and functioning from panjim he has handled various uh, uh, high profile cases like tarun bharat bajaj auto cement bricks to name a few 
Sir is well versed with multiple language, which includes a Hindi, English, Marathi, and Konkani, which happens to be the uh, uh, language of Goa. Sir has a, a flair for reading, debating, listening music, and playing, which includes some physical games like volleyball, badminton, and so on and so forth. Sir has been a very active member during his college days, and he was a very active member in the student uh, movement that is uh, Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad, that is ABVP. Sir has a flair for elocution, debate. and he's social activist in in goa and today we are very blessed to have him as our principal guest speaker thank you very much pravin sir for taking out your time now i'll introduce the second guest uh, for the day now it is our honor to have such uh, uh, good dignitaries uh, on on a single day at a single platform uh, advocate uh, virendra ishal karanji kar sir thank you very much sir so uh, he also has a very long profile but i'll cut it down because we have a, a time constraint sir has been a pioneer in pil public interest litigation which are majorly concerned with uh, the temple management in and around uh, maharashtra he has played a vital role in bringing out or exposing various kind of a corruption and uh, uh, wrong activities which were happening in various temp temples like vitthal rukmai temple uh, tulja bhavani temple mahalakshmi temple and so on and so forth he was principally responsible for uh, regetting the 100 um, 102 uh, 1200 acres of land which was encroached which basically belongs to the vitthal rukmai uh, temple but now out of that 100 1200 uh, acres 1000 acres has been brought back uh, sir has played a vital role in uh, in various pil across maharashtra he is a legal advisor to many ngos on pro bono basis uh he has played a vital role in environmental expect uh, expect also uh, uh he got a government order about pollutant paper pulp idol stage from national green tribunal got a slaughter house closed uh, near uh, thane which was polluting the river okay and sir is at presently handling very sensitive cases like the dabolkar uh, uh, murder case uh, best bakery case uh, to name a few Sir has also exposed the corruption in the maintenance of historical forts such as Singhgarh, Vishalgarh, and at present working on uh, Vijay Vijay Durg Fort. So this is a small introduction about the second speaker. Thank you very much, sir, for taking out time. Now uh, with this short introduction, I will uh, quickly pass it on to our uh, honourable principal, sir, uh, uh, Dr. Gorge, to introduce our college. Uh, over to you, sir. Good morning, all. I am Dr. Gorge, Principal Asmita College, Sukla Vikrol. This is the college founded by our former chairman Narbekar Sir in 2009. Since its inception, the college is working for the downtrodden and less privileged people. If you see the college, that's in the hub of Mumbai city metropolitan. financial capital capital of india if you see this special feature of the area where the college is nestled that area is the working colony workers colony the major object of the establishing the college of our chairman was less privileged people should get education quality education within reasonable fees and certainly we have been a successful in giving education to less privileged people the area is surrounded by apartment our students are really good our students get the education what it is to be given and what is quality education see this college, this college i hello 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 am i audible yes sir yes sir yes yeah 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 this is the college where when education is imparted we keep in mind that all round development of students should be taken all round development is being done how it is done there are several areas teaching revaluation sports and extra curricular activities teaching is well done by all professors if i talk about our professors see now there are the several gems and jewels with the college and one of them has been advocate lukunde ravi lukunde and from this we understand the ability of our teachers 
not this much, see now. Our teachers now became magistrate. Our teachers now became everything and reached to each and every corner of life. Yes, every branch is abided by and adorned by them. And thus, good education is carried. And in every area, our students are going ahead. I'm really happy that the college is able to participate Sir, in, in almost all areas. Yes, I am now able. Finally, uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. You, are, you are audible, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. We all means in the college we try to do maximum good for the students. We make them participate in various seminars, inter colleges, competitions, and we also conduct their moot court practical training and make them to visit parliament yeah and be share office codes high codes and supreme courts to police stations and make them to visit the experienced advocate and then they get experience our, our from them it's better this may be the yes groups of fin um, technology uh, sir uh, sir you can go ahead sir you are very much audible uh, yeah okay okay right and this is the college at the hub and this is the college yes one of the popular causes in the university of mumbai friends the management the teachers and the students mostly we get mature students almost all are good students and our students are studious they study and as teacher reach to every corner of life even students also reach to every corner of life. Mostly, every year, more than 20 to 25 percent students go abroad for their PG and other areas to be done. Now, I must say with honor that our students now has been faculty with us, has been principals, has been in various posts which are worthy for to be. This is the college we have been doing here. As uh, Rabbi Lokande said, say, this is the NGO that say I'm Darthak. And doing is doing means reducing the death of common man. Advocate Lokande, I yes, I to remind you you were of faculty. And the object of our sir, chairman sir, is this only that everyone whether he has money or no money, no money, he should join and build his life and he should be a successful person in the life. We base on making a good citizen out of nothing. And this is the aim of our, our institution. Today's program is really worth, and this is matching with the objective of the college. And for this program, those who have been there, that is Advocate Prab uh, Praveen Faldesai, Deputy Solicitor General, Advocate Virendra Ichal Karanjis, a criminal uh, advocate, and Rabbi Lokande, that the Supreme Court is advocate. I'm happy that these people are with us, and it's, a, it's noteworthy that the today's chapter may be arms act. UAPA, Tada, Prevention of Corruption, MOCA, POTA, and many others. They have been passed just to reduce criminality in the society. But I feel that these acts passed as and when government came in trouble, or local, mostly, local. mostly the, the political party who was in power came in trouble even then this is this was the situation this was the background but object is to reduce criminality in the society as per the darshi hamdar tak the object is there the work is there college is with them i am happy with that this you know a uh, in yeah a non-government organization should be with us forever 
and we will be doing the awareness in common mind. Our objective the same. I wish them and the colleagues all the best. And we all good people are in this march to make the life of common man happy and make them the good citizen of India. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gorge sir, for your kind words and a, a simple and a very uh, fantastic introduction about the college and its working. So now uh, there is one more dignitary uh, whose introduction I have skipped. I apologize for the same. And uh, we have uh, uh, Ravindra Ashok Lokande sir also with us. Uh, sir has completed his uh, LLB from uh, New Law College, that is from Pune. Uh, sir has completed LLM from Mumbai University. He also uh, has a diploma in ADR, that is Alternate Dispute Resolution, also a diploma in Intellectual Property Law. Uh, he is a postgraduate diploma in Human Rights Law from National Law School, Bangalore. Uh, at present, sir is Additional Advocate General for the State of Arunachal Pradesh from last four years. Uh, standing Council for the State of uh, Central Government Panel Council in Supreme Court, representing the State of Uttar Pradesh in Supreme Court. Worked as uh, Honorable Assistant Government Leader for the State of Maharashtra. Worked as Legal Advisor at uh, uh, to National Cooperative Banks. Worked as Panel Council, Central uh, Government Leader Union. Legal Advisor College of Physicians and Surgeons of Bombay. Also worked with Maharashtra State Human Rights Commission. Court member Mahatma Gandhi International Hindi University, Varda. So with this small introduction, now uh, we have come to the uh, principal part of our program today. Now, without uh, making any further delay, I hand over uh, it to the principal speaker today. That is uh, uh, Faldesai sir. Faldesai sir will be taking us uh, uh, across uh, this particular topic. Over to you, sir. Issue today for discussion is what is the meaning of a sanction in the criminal law and how it has developed. And then there are several other issues. Uh, we will also develop our uh, discussion on, on this point. Predominantly, I think this topic came in mind of the organizers because of the famous or infamous case, which is recently decided by our High Court Nagpur bench uh, in GN Sai Baba's case where the court has considered that sanction uh, was not in the proper terms as it was required to be granted. And, and one of the accused, the sanction was not granted prior to the court taking cognizance of it. One witness was examined and subsequently the uh, investigation agency obtained the sanction from the uh, concerned officer. And that is the reason why, the, why our High Court has even refused to go into the merits of the case and decide the case on the merits and said that because the absence of the sanction itself, the accused will get benefit and uh, therefore they are given the benefit. Of course, today's situation is that the matter went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has uh, ceased with the matter. I think there is also a stay granted by the Supreme Court on that order and the release of those accused has been uh, has been for temporarily stayed. Supreme Court will take a call on that issue. But a topic is now raised for discussion and I'm happy that about 250 people are, uh, are available here on a Sunday morning to discuss this issue and that itself highlights the importance uh, of this issue and, that, uh, and the discussion required amongst the legal fraternity uh, and predominantly the law students who are going to uh, take this chariot ahead uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming future. The question is, uh, what is the sanction? In the very simple language, if we have to say, sanction means it is an official permission to do something or to alter something or to make something. This is the clear dictionary, clear dictionary meaning of the term sanction. But today we are discussing about the issue of what is the sanction in terms of law? What is the sanction in terms of a particular act? There are uh, several acts under which this sanction is required. And in what manner it has to be obtained? What will happen if the sanction is not obtained? What will happen if the sanction is defective? What is the manner in which the, uh, uh, which, in which the officer concerned will have to uh, grant or reject the sanction? All these are the, are the points of uh, discussion. Now, in several acts, like for example, uh, it's discussed and it's mentioned in the 
uh, in the in head notes also which are circulated that the arms act is their uh, prevention of corruption act both uh, the earlier one 1947 act also and the uh, the, the recent one the 1988 act also uh, has a provision for sanction the tada pota and the uapa act which is now again in the in, in view of that pfi ban again the uh, unlawful activities prevention act is also being discussed everywhere so these are the acts under which a sanction is required if we if we carefully examine the uh, uh, system of criminal jurisprudence uh, what we know is that we are too much accused friendly jurisprudence and therefore all these things are there now sanction is not only in those two or four or five acts which i have just mentioned but sanction is also available in ipc 196 197 we know crpc mentions that sanction is required there cannot be no prosecution against a particular person or a particular authority or a judicial officer there cannot be a, a, a prosecution without a sanction so this is the development of law that is taking place where sanction is uh, mentioned now under a particular law there is a particular authority appointed to grant that particular uh, sanction in uh, uh, in earlier cases tada um, you, uh, tada or pota or those uh, uh, when we are in the online mode these uh, things will happen so yes, what i was saying is that uh, in in tada and uh, in uh, pota etc the sanction granting authority was uh, specified in uh, corruption uh, prevention of corruption cases in uh, uapa there are authorities which are uh, specified in certain cases it is where where the uh, sanction is required to be obtained against a person who is an officer who is non removable from the service the person who cannot just be thrown out of the service that person like higher higher rank officers the sanction is required to be granted by the government and in the cases where an officer is removable from service the appointing authority who is also the removing authority of that particular officer is the empowered authority to grant sanction or to reject sanction now in certain states in terms of a, a rules of business of that particular state uh, when we say government it will be the chief secretary of that particular state uh, who will be competent enough to grant a uh, sanction in certain states some other states in maximum states i would say that when we say the government is the competent authority it would be the chief minister or the minister concerned of that particular department who will be the competent authority to grant uh, sanctions so i would say that sanction is basically an additional filter because see once the case is investigated and the charge sheet is required to be filed before the court the court will obviously consider the case investigated by the investigation agency may it be the local police may it be cbi may it be nia whatever is the agency that is investigating they will have to file a charge sheet in terms of crpc we all know that now this CR, when the charge sheet is filed before the court, the court will obviously look into the um, uh, matter, look into the, somebody will remind me of the time, huh? look into the uh, uh, aspect of the charge sheet and consider whether this de uh, deserves uh, framing of charge, whether charge is required to be framed, whether the evidence on record is, uh, is, uh, is uh, inspiring enough confidence that the person should be convicted or not or it leads to the acquittal this is the decision that the court takes but these particular uh, certain laws certain uh, 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 crimes are required that before it actually goes to the court for uh, for either conviction or acquittal or trial the there is another appointed authority which i said earlier that will examine whether the investigation has taken place in the correct sense whether investigation report actually makes out the case for a framing of charge and whether there must be a charge sheet filed before the court. Now this, in any case, as I say, is an additional filter that is made available in the uh, in these acts. So therefore, what was the need of this, this uh, particular, uh, see in all cases it is not available. Like for example, a cheating case is there. A, a person is uh, being prosecuted for that uh, that particular offense that particular uh, case will not require a sanction any person who is prosecuted for a murder or any other uh, heinous crime there will be no need of sanction from any authority 
but in under these acts which are uh, more serious uh, nature there is a requirement of uh, this sanction and this is this the need arose because of the uh, the supreme court now says that because malicious prosecution and all those things to crop all these issues this was required but if if anybody asks me as the question is there today also that what is sanction and why it is required if i have to answer this question i would say that it is not required at all because our jurisprudence is strong enough to consider our investigation agencies are good enough to um, uh, to investigate cases properly and place the cases before the court but this filter is there i would say it is not required but everybody will not feel that it is not required the supreme court and uh, various high courts in our country feels that it is uh, required because of the uh, i would say that there is a there is a kind of a stage where when the accused is brought before the court what the court believes is that the accused is the best person on the earth and the person who has investigated against him is the is the uh, 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 is the villain of the story the witnesses in the case are uh, probably the the persons who are supporting the villain of the story and the accused who is the innocent person who is brought before the court has to be proved guilty beyond any reasonable doubt and the accused is entitled to raise any kind of a doubt before the court and the court says that this doubt is not answered by the investigation agency therefore the prosecution fails the case culminates into an acquittal what is the percentage of our uh, conviction one does not know maybe five percent or so at the initial stage then we have a high court then we have a supreme court so i do not know what actually is the percentage of conviction in our our country but the rate of crime is very high so therefore this kind of a additional filter whether it was required or not is a debatable question in my opinion but the court does not find favor with my opinion so therefore the court is superior so we have to go with all these things now when is this issue of uh, sanction originated in the in the uh, law let us not go into the latin aspect of it or the magna carta type uh, type 1600 and all where uh, all these things uh, originated but uh, just prior to uh, uh, the uh, independence of our country the the requirement of sanction is not originating from the arms act or from the Pro uh, Pre uh, prevention of corruption act or from the uapa act they are today the custodian of it they have the provision of uh, of sanction for this but it is not arising from there it is arising from somewhere else and there if we examine why it is arising a different story will come in uh, uh, come in light i'll give only one example and the example is in 1943 the uh, british uh, india government the british india government is to used to issue several orders for for all kinds of business all kinds of uh, running of government in india and they were governed by these orders now there is something called cotton cloth yarn control order 1943 now this is one of the simple uh, order issued by the government controlling the cotton and um, cloth uh, cloth uh, mercantile uh, agency in india there in that order of 1943 there used to be one clause which is called clause 18 which says it's it's so simple clause which says that any person shall not uh, stock the cotton or cloth more than what is permissible limit permissible limit was prescribed in that particular order and the clause was that anybody is not permitted now we, we have all this rationing today also in civil supply agencies we have this kind of clauses that overstocking of anything is illegal so this came from that uh, order of 1943 but when this this is the simplest issue now it has got nothing to do with terrorism it has got nothing to do with uh, um, heinous crimes nothing just overstock stocking of a particular item that is also cotton the british government felt and introduced clause number 23 in that particular uh, order saying that whenever a prosecution will be lodged against the against any person under clause 80 violation of clause 18 for overstocking the cotton there will be a requirement of sanction now understand why will be this requirement of uh, sanction 
came in picture in 1943 when in 1943 when this particular order was there to my mind it is very simple i would proudly say that even during the british time or pre british time or any time our courts have been uh, proved to be uh, proved their integrities the courts have been non biased the courts have been non partial the courts have been uh, fair and the decisions when the when the matter came before the court only of, upon looking at the merits of the matter the court would decide without looking at the skin of the person or the caste of the person or the creed of the person or anything it is only on the merits so when there was a need of prosecution um, sanction uh, for prosecution i simply think why probably because there were two kinds of officers one was a british national who is the officer in india and one is the indian national who is officer in india now if a prosecution is lodged before the court the court which is impartial will look at the documents and prosecute the person and convict the person or acquit the person on the merits of the case so if the british officer goes before the court there is a risk of uh, the court uh, considering him maybe conviction so if there is a additional filter made in made uh, made between the court and the investigation agency what will happen is the court is bound by law and if the law says that if the government doesn't grant a sanction the court will not even take the cognizance of the case so therefore before going to the court about a particular prosecution there is a authority appointed to curb to check whether there is anything on record now probably at that point of time sanctions were granted sanctions were not granted to a particular officer but but this is what my understanding is and if we uh, see there was a case of, of this particular order itself of cotton uh, cloth and yarn in 1946 our high court bombay high court has decided a case sir yes. uh, uh, we we have to adhere to the timeline sir we have the uh, next speaker also on the yes. same court. all right so therefore in uh, in 1946, our High Court uh, has decided an issue of sanction. In 1948, out of the same case in Gokulchan Dwarkadas Morarka, 1948 Privy Council, the, uh, so the Privy Council uh, has considered this issue because 1948, there was a five judge bench in Privy Council and India was independent then. So the decision is there today, one of the leading, uh, old also, but a leading decision that sanction is not a technical it is required to be granted etc and sanction issue has been from right from there now we are on the issue of situation is slightly different there are several uh, aspects the supreme court uh, uh, has uh, has said that requirement of sanction is required in what matter it is what manner it is to be granted what is required to be considered by the sanctioning authority all uh, these things are given so basically this is the uh, uh, this is the issue of sanction and uh, this is how it has uh, come up it is requirement is like this uh, next speaker can also talk about yeah. it thank you very much sir now i pass on the same question to the next speaker uh, ichil karanji sir if you can just throw some light on this if, uh, thank you sir yes thank you just to clarify my surname is ichil karanji kar uh, it ends with like uh, Gavaskar, Tendulkar and all that. So, uh, to begin with, I was slightly your, worried. Your betting, your betting also will be like them only. <laughs> In fact, I was slightly worried because uh, the other two speakers today are invariably representing the state or the central government. And I, ha I had to take on my shoulder the role of the devil's advocate. But I am happy that Pravind sir has already spoken of his mind quite openly. And I, I'm, I'm, I must second his opinion. See, I'll just give another shape to my perception. How this issue of sanction has come up. 196, 195, 197, you go to CRPC, there is a portion of sanction. And it talks about the selective offenses uh, uh, incorporated in IPC. For example, say 153A or 153B of Indian Penal Code or uh, 5052 or 295A of Indian Penal Code, where there is a clash between two communities. And if there is a clash between two communities uh, inciting uh, 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 writing like situations or communal hatred, then it would go to the government 
to grant or not to grant sanction. This was the way British wanted to rule us. This, this was the way British wanted to control the society and that controlling of the society was for their own selfish gains. And that tradition we try, we went on inculcating in all other uh, uh, statutes and all those things. So whether this is an outdated tradition now, whether we need to really go into a contemplating mode is really a question. Second aspect, this is one where a government tries to control the societal patterns. That's what that, that's the one thing. And second is like in Prevention of Corruption Act, the object of grant or non-grant of corruption goes on to say that there should not be a malified uh, prosecution of an honest public uh, servant. Now the issue is, it's it's a uh, insulation created by public servants from themselves. And you will find in various other statutes, take for example, Income Tax Act, there are so many benefits granted to public servants. The two uh, five weeks a day, uh, five days a week is another thing. But even there, the perquisites granted to public servants are exempted from the crutches of income tax. So here, a public servant tries to safeguard himself rather than safeguard an honest uh, public servant. This is how it goes, is a public's perception, including myself. So we have the sanctioning process where the legislative says, like Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, when the provision of sanction was incorporated in 2008, the then uh, Minister P. Chidambaram has made a speech in the assembly, which is which we can find also on Google. He says we are insulating and we are creating an independent authority to review sanctions so that the person made an accused is not harassed. It is, it is an insulation against police excesses, so as to say. Like you might have gone through the DK Basu judgment, uh, two, three judgments, it ha has uh, already come in that uh, portion. So it is uh, another, another safeguard from police excesses. But let us come to the ground reality, whether it really exists. Now, uh, I'll, I'll take to Section 39 of the Arms Act. Section 39 of Arms Act says that if a person is found with some illegal possession of a firearm or arms, so as to say, covered under the Arms Act, unless the sanction is granted by the district magistrate, no court can take cognizance of the case. Here comes the funny thing. The district magistrate is supposed to decide whether that person is should be prosecuted or not. Then the question arises, and many places that the authority of the district magistrate is delegated to his subordinate, like a deputy district magistrate or something, who is normally a collector of a district. Now the question is whether that district magistrate or the person who is in charge, who has the discretion to grant or reject the sanction, does really have a training about arms? Does he knows what kind of arms a position is illegal, whether the police who uh, found that arm on the body of a person or in the custody of a person had really done so? The answer is no, there is no training. There is no process laid down for the district magistrate to decide whether the, uh, uh, the case falls in which slot. And then we have cases over cases where police would, may, many, many times I would say that police would file a case and they will send the papers or just two letters to the district magistrate kindly grant a sanction and a reply would come sanction is granted so what is the purpose being served in the in this in this process of course if it is to provide uh, an insulation to protect from the police excesses then is it not necessary that in many cases if the police get a, a tip that's at so and so place somebody is there with some illegal arms in his custody and he is he is in his intentions are, are, are to sell that weapons to somebody, etc. Then can the police not carry a person from the district magistrate's office to physically verify what is the situation there? That person can vouch as a third person, as an independent person, how the search was made, how the arrest was made, how the seizure was made. But no, we are not considering, we are not thinking on those lines. We have stuck up to an old tradition which has long been outdated. This is about Arms Act. Now let us come to the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. I just mentioned about P. Chidambaram and 
he is saying so many things about that. Here is a case uh, which uh, Mr. Praveen sir also mentioned that Sai Baba judgment which was which by high court uh, acquitting him from the uapa charges and now it is stayed by the supreme court but you will find a sanction and a report by the uh, director of prosecution the report is so sketchy so uh, short and is on face of it it shows that there is no application of mind then what is the purpose of it there needs to be a survey there needs to be a open publication in how many cases sanction was given and the case resulted into an acquittal then who is the responsible person whether it is it has become only only a namesake now let us come to tada tada was incorporated in a situation where when, when punjab was in a writing situation while uh, uh, broke out in punjab khalistan movement was going on there all those things at that background tada was uh, incorporated it it contains it contained a provision section i think 20a it has two layers. First layer is no FR will be registered unless permission is taken from the, uh, uh, the uh, SP, superintendent of police. So this is one insulation. And second insulation is no court can take cognizance unless there is a sanction by the inspector general of police. So here was a case that a police will be investigating and police will be sanctioned. They slightly changed it in POTA. They give this authority to the central government. And the further step is in UAPA, where there are two layers, but all these layers ultimately have remained on paper, or rather a person would feel that it is it has just remained on paper. And again, there is another issue which goes to the root of the matter. Many of you might have read constitution, many of you might be going to study constitution, but as a uh, as a fundamental principle constitution lays down or separates three government organs three organs of the state one is legislative executive and judiciary so when law is passed by le legislative it is being implemented by executive and uh, the judiciary a, is a check on the constitutional merits and also whether the law is implemented properly we all know that now here is a case a police registers FIR, either it is CBI or police or National Investigation Agency, etc. I, I will sort it, shorten it as a police. It registers an FIR. This police is a hand or a finger of the executive only. Then it goes for grant or uh, non-grant of sanction. Now the grant or non-grant of sanction is again an executive act. Is under administrative law. Is no judicial value. Then then it will go to the court but before that when a charge sheet is to be filed there are rules within the police department that charge sheet will not be filed as per the whims and wills of the investigating officer it has to be weighted from his superiors so there is yet another check then it goes to the court the magistrate has the authority to order further investigation if he finds the charge sheet is improper then it goes to the trial court the trial court has the authority to discharge the accused how many layers we want to go on creating one layer after another one layer after another and like he said the uh, the rate of conviction in these cases is yet again too low then another question arises that if the sanctioning authority gave sanction after going through all the relevant documents by application of its own mind and all those things if it results in an acquittal whether that sanctioning authority who is a government servant should not also be held responsible for uh, falsicious prosecution of a person but there is also no rule nothing on record to say so so that of course that is another part but i was on constitutional issue an executive within an executive prevents the judicial uh, officer to take cognizance so here is this layering like i said earlier it was for the british by the british whether now we, we need to continue with these things and answer is an obvious no but for this and why i am saying this to you all because maybe somebody must be thinking that we needed to know the intricacies of that law or some sections or some case laws but but as law students you must also be going through all those things and why we should go we should uh, brainstorm this the answer is very simple you take up the independent independence days the leaders we had 
इन्क्लूडिंग गांधी आंबेडकर सावरकर टिड़क देन नेहरू ऑल दिस ऑल दिस गैलेक्सी ऑफ लीडर्स इज एन एडवोकेट इवन टूडे यू विल फाइंड सो मेनी लीडर्स आर एडवोकेट सो वी एडवोकेट्स आर बेसिकली सोशल साइंटिस्ट दैट्स वॉट आई फील एंड एज अ प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ हिंदू विरिजन परिषद वेर एवर आई मीट एडवोकेट्स और एक्टिविस्ट एडवोकेट्स आई कैन सी आई कैन प्राउडली से that is we people who who need to bring in some change and therefore we are we don't want to disrespect the present legal system or the judiciary but at the same time it's for on our shoulders and as you the upcoming generation is on your shoulders to change this and lead the society on a on a uh, on a better uh, level so therefore this was my some inputs on the issue uh, i i think it's over to you vishal again yes Thank sir you. uh thank you very much sir for your uh, uh, thought provoking thank you, words uh, now i'll i'll put up the second question uh, uh, again back to for this i sir the question is uh, how it has served the justice delivery system in various laws court laws the sanctions just one second sir uh, riddhi gada you have to uh, mute yourself okay yes sir we can go ahead well well the question is how the issue on how the requirement of sanction has served the justice delivery system in india our law whatever whenever the law is made by the framers of the that particular statute it remains sometimes it is full fledged uh, sometimes it remains some amendment comes but most of the time it is developed or in some cases deteriorated by judicial pronouncements the law is getting developed as and when there is more discussion more research more uh, deliberations on it more debate more discussions on it and then it gets uh, fine tuned here also initially the requirement of uh, sanction as i said the, the it was considered to be a, a issue of a technical point whether the uh, the person will consider the case and grant a sanction and uh, it will be before the court but since that is the additional filter that is the additional protection granted to the accused the uh, accused has always taken uh, benefit of that and tried to develop a develop an argument through wonderful lawyers like mr richard ekaranjikar and mr sal singhikar and mr Lo, uh, ravi lokhande and all these people who appear for uh, uh, accused the wonderful pleas are taken before the court of law and law gets developed into a uh 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 it goes on a different level like for example about the sanction if you see 1995 uh, 96 issues 97 and all the issue was of course it was said that it is one of the important part that uh, sanction uh, is there required but not at so much large scale that the benefits were uh, given to the accused initially it was held to be a, a technical issue then the supreme court has come out with a case that uh, it is an administrative action right from uh, beginning even before this particular act came in uh, picture the previous issues of sanction they said that it is uh, administrative action and later lately the supreme court uh, has been saying that for this purpose a proper application of mind by the officer granting sanction is required there was a case of ayya swami versus state in 1995 in the supreme court where a, a entire uh, report was reproduced in the uh, sanctioning order and the sanction was granted the supreme court says in ayya swami that such reproduction is not a, a sanction at all in terms of law because required is that it is a additional filter so the supreme court consider that this is the benefit one more benefit given to the accused so the sanctioning authority has a duty to apply his mind and therefore mere reproduction of what is produced before him is not a sanction so then then in uh, state of tamil nadu versus mm rajendra 1997 the supreme court says that the uh, authority who is granting sanction must sit with it and examine each and every document a proper application of mind is required and it is only when everything is examined with the presence of mind then the sanction is uh, to be granted or rejected depending on the case of that particular uh, uh, that particular case which is before the authority there was a case in 1997 supreme court mansukhlal chawan versus state of gujarat 
where the Supreme Court said that initially what would happen that when it comes to the court through evidence it was there that what was uh, uh, there before the sanctioning authority for granting of grant of sanction these many documents were there he examined this examined that he uh, checked the reports and then he come to a conclusion that there must be a sanction or there must not be a sanction but the supreme court says that it should not come by way of an evidence in mansuk lal's case mansuk lal versus state of gujarat 1997 supreme court says that this particular exercise of examining the document and that the application of mind is there in this particular case must be called out from the sanction order itself so therefore the sanctioning authority must now in the order says that i have examined this i have done this i have done this i have done this i applied my mind and therefore i come to the conclusion that this is something so it is no more a technical everything it's like a another judicial uh, uh, consideration of the uh, of the case then comes there is one case of uh, state of goa versus babu thomas 90 uh, sorry 2005 supreme court the, the the supreme court in babu thomas says that if there is no proper sanction the court is itself prohibited from taking cognizant pro, pro, prosecution itself cannot be uh, continued so therefore in 2005 supreme court says that now thereafter maharashtra state of maharashtra versus mahesh jain uh, matter came and then uh, the several uh, several uh, issues those all cases we will not be able to uh, uh, figure out today ultimately up to 2014 this ups and downs came in supreme court decided several matters said several things about the uh, grant of sanction positive negative about sanction but ultimately the famous case of cbi versus ashok kumar came up in 2014 the supreme court and the supreme court in this case says that the grant of sanction is a very important aspect of a prosecution wherever that sanction is mentioned that particular sanction is the requirement of law and the supreme court has issued certain guidelines those guidelines are enumerated and they are those are those are circulated to all the high courts all departments all investigation agencies saying that whenever there is a requirement of a sanction in terms of these any particular law this is the manner in which the sanction is required to be done and the supreme court has in fact uh, granted uh, given guidelines what has to be done like for example the every every record which is there before the investigation agency must be placed before the uh sanctioning authority the authority has to be himself examine everything without getting influenced by any uh, any of the investigation officers comment and and so on those guidelines are there and in terms of those guidelines today the sanction is uh, is required to be issued and now uh, gn sai baba's case also uh, is come we are aware i i think most of us have uh, gone through this sai baba uh, gn sai baba case also so all these uh, cases these are the several cases where the judicial pronouncements have uh, uh, aided in development of this law now the answer to the question is how is this system served the uh, justice delivery system the law has developed the way i said i mean i have not uh, said so many judgments there are truck load of judgments which will uh, be available in this uh, this particular scenario this particular uh, cases in what manner how the sanction is required to be granted including this ashok kumar's uh, case but the question is what is the justice delivery system now um, um, somehow i have a habit of answering a uh, question in a uh, asking by asking a question uh, again first of all what do we mean by justice delivery system this is the additional benefit that is given to the accused is this all what we mean justice delivery system is the meaning of fair trial and i am a fair supporter i am a very hardcore supporter of a fair trial i believe just like our uh, courts who believe that every accused should be given a fair trial he must get a fair chance to de defend uh, defend his case but my question is a fair trial in itself is a justice uh, justice delivered the accused friendly juris, criminal jurisprudence which we practice today in india is itself a 
uh, justice delivery system because of this kind of uh, judgments are given is, is the justice done every accused has is required to be proved guilty beyond reasonable doubt so every accused which raise one particular doubt and the benefit of doubt is given to that accused and is acquitted is the justice done is this a justice delivery system in my opinion there requires to be something more uh, we, we must discuss when we say justice uh, delivery system if want of sanction is another loophole created in the system is it a justice delivery system is the is the justice done by 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 creating this uh, this particular loophole and what is the number now we say that because to grant a safe uh, additional safeguard to the person who has uh, who has been maliciously prosecuted what is the number of the malicious prosecution in our country maybe fair good number is there but the justice delivery system has forgotten the victim for all this while it took as as late as 2016 for the supreme court also to mention that victim is also an important part of justice delivery system and all that benefits which are given to the accused which are in maybe i if i may say so which are undue for it which are undue benefits given to him are actually not justice done to him but it is injustice done to the victim now for example who is the victim in the cases where uh, uh, unlawful activities uh, act is concerned who should be the victim in arms case there is no one particular victim there for a for a uh, for a arms arms case so therefore it is the entire society now if we just create a hurdle saying that this particular system is required and sanction is required and this is the manner in which sanction is required and if the sanction is not required there is one spelling mistake there is one grammatical mistake the uh, there is one xyz of the of the uh, sanctioning authority do we say that the entire trial is vitiated and how do we pronounce that the particular accused is innocent just because the sanctioning authority has not granted a proper sanction in terms of law or the investigation agency has failed to obtain a proper sanction from the authority does it really mean that a person who has blasted a, a bomb in the railway in mumbai is innocent because of uh, of the of the of the fault in the sanction the person who was caught with uh, um, with objectionable material at ahiri bus stand uh, near uh, uh, ahiri bus stand can be considered as uh, innocent because the sanction order is cryptic I mean, this is unheard of. This can't be the justice delivery system. This is injustice delivery system. The justice is not done to the society because of this system. So, therefore, in my opinion, these are the uh, these are the things which are required to be considered. Mr. Chandil Karanjikar is laughing at me. I do not know why. But these are my questions. To uh, no, no, I am not laughing at you. In fact, this is making some more. Uh, this this friction is will be bringing some more nectar out of it. So I am eager to reply. Uh, nothing else. <laughs> yeah, sir. Uh, we are just coming to you, sir. Uh, about yes, the, yes, please, uh, please, please. Uh, now, yes, now this, yeah. Now this is fun part of the story, and I will like to reply and uh, retort back to Mr. Faldesai. He raised so many questions. I agree. I do agree with you. But at the same time, let me give you two cases about CBI, who is supposed to be the principal torch bearer against the corruption cases as far as central government servants and public servants are concerned. One case comes from Tamil Nadu. The case was under the Mines and Minerals Corporation or some government organizations rela relating to Mines and Minerals. CBI raided uh, these uh, public servants and found a trail of corruption and it went on to seize 400 kilograms of gold from one Surana. And that, uh, these 400 kilograms, I'm repeating again, 400 kilograms of gold. And thereafter, it seized it. And thereafter, after, a, after six months of a, or a year, after making all hues and cries and... Uh, defaming a person who was a businessman this surana of course i'm not siding with him but let me say when cbi raids you when cbi arrests you and this makes headlines all over the nation and you are put into dock of a criminal after an year or so cbi comes to the court and says 
Well, or this person is innocent. We have nothing found against him. What about the gold seizure and all that? Yes, yes, that was seized. But now we are short of 100 kilograms of gold out of these 400 kilograms. We don't know where these 100 kilograms of gold evaporated. The High Court is compelled to file a, to register a case against CBI. And then CBI in the High Court says, we will investigate the matter. We are a premier investigation agency. And if investigation of shortage of this 100 kilograms of gold is handed over to the local police, it will be brought on our character, on our goodwill. Where do we have goodwill? When Supreme Court says CBI is like a caged parrot, but this is a reported judgment. See, Rama Subramanian versus uh, state, uh, state of Tamil Nadu, I think it is 2016 or 17 judgment. You just Google 100 kilograms of gold CBI, uh, you will get this judgment. Next, next judgment, he referred to Ashok Kumar. I remembered Ashok Agarwal, Supreme Court, CBI versus Ashok Agarwal. Ram, Ram Jet Malani was, uh, 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 had appeared in that case. In the judgment, Supreme Court categorically says about CBI that CBI hide some facts. CBI did not come with clean hands. It suppressed some material. Had it been placed before the court, the result would have been something different. So this is how about goes about the prosecution agencies. In the first session, Mr. Faldesai said that the court looks at the accused as a hero and the prosecution or the investigation agency as a villain. Let it be so or be not be so, but there are these kind of instances which we cannot, uh, we cannot forget. Second, under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, grant of bail is too difficult. In fact, I have some cases where completely innocent persons, where there is virtually no evidence against them, are in jail for six years, for three years, for four years only because Unlawful Activities Prevention Act is slapped against them. Now see how the government plays tricks in the cases and how the victim suffers and how again he is blamed that he is like king and court looks at, looks him, uh, looks at him as a king. Section 43D of UAPA says no bail shall be granted unless public prosecutor is heard. All right. And secondly, Unless the court finds that there is no prima facie, no prima facie cases made against against him, so it could it goes on a higher level. Grant of bail becomes difficult. Now what happens? Now who is heading uh, Orissa High Court? Uh, uh, he was earlier uh, in Delhi High Court judge, Mr. Murli Dharan. He granted bail to one Kashmir terrorist, and he went on to the extent that the statements recorded by the police, it was NIA in that case under 161 of CRPC are not evidence and therefore I am not supposed to read the 161 statements of the witnesses, I am granting bail. Obviously, this order was challenged before Supreme Court and a division bench of Supreme Court went down heavily against this judgment and said no, if there is some material against the accused, it has to be considered without going into the admissibility of that material that can be considered at the time of trial. Now we are in a situation where if a prosecution agency invokes Unlawful Activities Act and goes to the court, files a charge sheet, and the accused says, Malors, grant me bail. I am three years inside because of that UAPA. And the court asks the prosecution agency, kindly hear me. Yesterday only I made this argument in a court. In the bail, the agency says, my lords, I agree that I have annexed only some newspaper report about the accused as evidence. I have annexed Indian Express news or a news from a website or a news from Maharashtra Times as evidence that somebody is quoting or he's some photograph of that accused. There is no other evidence. I agree. But you are not supposed to decide the admissibility of the newspaper getting. That can be decided at the time of trial. Now, since there is one evidence given in the case, you are not supposed to examine the admissibility because the, this judgment I said about, uh, uh, the name is Zahur Ahmed Shah Watali, uh, NIA versus Zahur Ahmed Shah Watali 2019. That ties your hands, you are not entitled to grant bail. You can throw this paper, newspaper in dustbin at the time of trial, not now. So this is how it goes. UAPA has to be read with National Investigation Agency Act, which mandates day-to-day -day trials. 
let both of the other speakers tell how many cases day to day trials go on the answer is a unfortunate no and then session courts or the special courts would shake down their hands and say no no we cannot grant bail you go to high court it is constitutional court on the on the issue of delay they may grant you bail then the accused has to, has to run to an advocate he has to give some good fees and that accuse that the advocate will have to run to pillar and post because our courts are loaded with cases there is huge pendency and he stays inside that way so if this is the way it functions and who is saying i like i said under the prevention the most of the judgments on section have come in prevention of corruption act because it is about public servants make a comparison some day in uh, pc uh, in uapa tada pota arms act how much and prevention of corruption act how much because like i said is by the public servants for the public servants so in other cases in this case you remove the provision of sanction and i hope the more conviction will be in pc prevention of corruption cases act instead of this and let me remind you also one thing that i think 197 crpc also gives the same protection to the judges now comes the story that we have taken an adversarial system of jurisprudence what happens if a person languishes in jail for 4 5 years he, he and his family gets a stigma of an accused in the case and he is acquitted by the courts tomorrow what gets he what gives him in the in the 4 5 years of struggle he sells his land his family his relatives will turn away from him he is acquitted what happens whether the government compensates him the answer is no and then there will again be a, a layer for the public servants that anything done in good faith will not be prosecuted he will get that benefit so this benefits if public servants want to enjoy then accused also need to be given a fairness and in the backdrop of just two judgments i cited about the cbi 100 kilograms of gold uh, siphoning off and all those things there is no such case that the prosecution agencies are always transparent always clean always honest no 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 nothing in fact 2014 supreme court in uh, state of gujarat versus kishan bhai that's a beautiful judgment and i doubt whether that judgment is being implemented it says if the accused is acquitted then then there has to be an interdepartmental inquiry fixing the responsibility either on the investigation officer or the public prosecutor because something has gone wrong so this is one second 2005 prakash singh versus union of india where police complaint authority was uh, uh, directed to be constituted by the supreme court in fact i was the person who made a pl in the bombay high court and thereby this maharashtra state police complaint authority has come has come into existence but the government does not want to happen this police complaint authority is what if the police makes some excesses against you you can go to this authority making a complaint against the police but whether it is functioning the answer is no whether there are uh, the proper persons sitting as the authorities there is huge vacancy there is no website intimating the people that there is some structure because the government does not want these things to run and then only blaming the accused would not be a proper thing there are so many uh, rats on the both sides that can be said only thank you or do you uh, vishal thank you very much sir it was a very enlightening and a very deep deeply thought uh, thought uh, words uh so now quickly i I'll, i'll take uh, uh, the the baton to the audience now guys we are open for question and answer so if anybody wants to ask a question you may uh, unmute yourself because of the limitation of time we might not be able to take all the questions but you can unmute yourself uh, give your detail like your name your class and then you can address your question to either of the speaker may it be uh, to faldesai sir or may it be to hl karanji kar sir so if anybody wants to ask a question please go ahead and mute yourself and ask the question uh, this is not a question but uh, thanking thanks to one for this uh, very in, uh, informative information given by the professor thanks sir thank you thank you yeah, yeah uh, i guess uh, professor saili has a question uh, saili ma'am you can go ahead and mute yourself and ask the question please a uh, very good morning sir and thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, shedding light on a topic which is very very important to all the law students i have a question with regards to uap act so there is section 35 of the uap act under which an individual may be identified as a terrorist you know without any scrutiny judicial scrutiny or even before the commencement uh, of a trial 
so can we say that uh, this is violative to the uh, fundamental right which is uh, article 14 right to equality or article 19 which is freedom of speech and expression as well as article 21 which is right to life and personal liberty sir uh, as said by you the victim is also an important person when it comes to uh, the justice delivering system so can we say that the investigative agency has failed in getting proper sanction order with regard to this section 36 35 of the uap act uh, and it has not been held to be unconstitutional yes uap act is basically on various aspects the prosecution or the punishment uh, portion is mainly governed uh, under section uh, say 13 to 19 or certain other sections which are about membership of a ban organization or uh, like uh, taking up terrorist activities or the prohibited activities so as to say in short second aspect is about uh, seizure of the properties of the banned organization and there is a safeguard or there is a process by which a, an organization will be banned you may have heard the recent banning of popular front of india which might have been in coming for so many years in fact anyways that's that's not a, our issue today but when a person is uh, an organization is banned it, this act started in basically 1967 and earlier it was only about an organization then the lawmakers must have felt that or banning an organization is one thing but suppose there is one individual for example let us uh, take up with some person like uh, daud ibrahim whether he has an organization maybe no then what how do we go against such person because he's an individual then start then this this uh, this need was identified and then along with an organization to be claimed as a banned organization or a terrorist organization an individual was also Uh, included in that portion but invariably how it goes is like after such declaration it goes to the tribunal like in a, in a banned organizations case it goes to a tribunal and the judge of the tribunal will be a high court judge the ban earlier it was 2 years now it has increased up to 5 years but it's not a blanket ban it it will go like this the tribunal will decide on the basis of evidence before him or after hearing both the parties whether the ban is justified or not and if the tribunal finds that the ban is justified then only that order for say 3 years 2 years 5 years whichever is made by the government will be sustained otherwise the tribunal has the power to set it aside so this is another portion of that act which which provides a hearing but uh, like the the process goes like this uh, under the bootleggers or gunda act the many states have this uh, there is long name to that act but they can uh, uh, put a person in prison for 12 months it's a preventive action or even under 144 of crpc they can prohibit uh, 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 mob coming together it's a prohibitive action so this banning or declaring a person as a terrorist is a prohibitive action and that action will be given uh, will be placed before a uh, uh, before the judiciary this way it, it will go that's another section of course like i said there is one revenue section there is one organizational section which will be curbing the freedom of expression and all those things and the other portion will be related to the offences over to you pravin sir question was uh, whether uh, section 35 of the wpa act was uh, is uh, unconstitutional qua article 14 and 19 of the constitution of india now after 2017 zindal stainless steel versus uh, punjab the supreme court has said that the the uh, uh, points on which the law will be declared unconstitutional are limited now one of the uh, aspect of fundamental uh, rights article violation of uh, article 14 Uh, is but the, largely the issue uh, of uh, constitutional validity will come on the legislative competence whether the whether the particular parliament or the or the or the or the institution which framed the law is competent or not or whether it is covered failed or not F- fundamental uh, violation of a particular person's fundamental right may not be a very 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 strong ground to declare that particular provision as unconstitutional provision because uh, such provisions are also required 
maybe a uh, misuse of uh, that particular section or misuse of that particular act has to be uh, stopped and that is the reason why all this sanction and the judicial uh, all this exercise is available for that only but in my opinion uh, it is not the act which can be declared as unconstitutional on the basis of uh, constitution uh, yes sir. i uh, i have uh, a question once again uh, so uh, specifically put right into section 35 section 35 a person is arrested uh, even without a warrant okay and secondly that person is also declared as a terrorist without any judicial scrutiny or even before the commencement of trial is it not a breach of the fundamental right uh, i'm not talking uh, specifically about the entire act but this particular section uh, may i say something on this like uh, uh, provincers uh, first lines made me more clarity on this line uh, tada was challenged entire entire act constitutional validity was challenged you will find it in kartar singh versus i think union of india mr jethmalani had argued extensively and the supreme court except a provision or two uh, sustained its validity and said no there is no such issue and therefore thereafter pota came and thereafter this uap which was actually in existence since 1967 i think that no uh, such uh, uh, issue like raised by you has been challenged before supreme court right now and the reason one of the reasons is reasonable classification constitution talks about reasonable classification plain classification is different reasonable classification is different first and second the right of uh, freedom of expression or the other rights or all those things uh, article 19 or 14 are always subject to something like public policy law and order and all those things so there that right has to be uh, sacrificed if it is for the overall society so these are the two things which i remember right now thanks all to you pravin sir if you want thank to share sir. on this thank you thank you sir That's uh, enough. thank you for answering the question um, anybody else i guess uh, saurav is there who has a question saurav you can unmute yourself and go ahead with your question please सर आज लेक्चर खूब छान होता सर मैं एक डाउट होता कि एक एक गोपाल मध्य स्टेट ऑफ मद्रास स्टील हंटिंग करते का इंडियन जुडिशरी कारण तिथा ड्यू प्रोसेस ऑफ लॉ होते नहीं है आज जे क्रक्स जर बोल कि ड्यू प्रोसेस ऑफ फॉलो होते नहीं है अर्थ अस हो ना मग एक गोपाल कि गोलकनाथ केस आई एम सॉरी शुड आई गो इन इंग्लिश हिंदी और सर आई गेस मराठी विल डू चंद्रचूडांचे वडील तेव्हा त्या बेंच मध्ये होते आणि त्याच्या ह्या जजमेंट नंतर ते म्हणाले होते की आम्ही फार घाबरलेले होतो आणि हल्ली दोन वर्षापूर्वी जेव्हा या जस्टिस चंद्रचूडांनी एक जजमेंट दिलं ते म्हणाले माझ्या वडिलांचं जे राहिलं ते मी या वेळेला करू शकलो सो ए के गोपालन हा म्हणजे केशवानंद भारतीचा इतिहास आहे किंवा ए के गोपालनची केस आहे अशा काही केसेस आहेत ज्याच्याबद्दल खरं लॉ स्टुडंट्सना एक वेगळा चॅप्टर म्हणून शिकवायला पाहिजे बिकॉज लॉ स्टुडंट्स आर नॉट ओनली लॉ स्टुडंट्स सम ऑफ यू आय होप विल गो ऑन टू बिकम जजेस session court judges and may reach to supreme court or you become public prosecutor or you will become like uh, crusaders for the for the public clause tar ha ja hi ji judgments hai na hi amala shikavli geli pahije ki kasa judiciary ne tya vela kasa keshwanand bharti madhe an re na promote kela ani teen senior most judges na bajula thevla hota tya tigani kasha kase rajinama dile कशा पद्धति ने बैंक नैशनलाइजेशन केस मध्य सरकार सरकार सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने अनावश्यक ऐकल कशा पद्धति ने प्रीवी पर्सेस केस दोन दोन सुप्रीम कोर्ट समोर आली कशा पद्धति ने आर्टिकल कि फोर्टी टू अमेन्डमेंट जी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन या सुरुआती अजु ही बदलली गेली नहीं है असे बरेच प्रश्न खरे आज अपने स्वतः विचार अपन इतरान संगाला पाजे कारण जस मैं मगाशी मुला आई बिलवीन इट कि आपन, आपन कायदा समझतो समाज कसा वागला पाजे कसा वगतो समझतो समझना समाज कुछ न्यायालय कहते 
आपली एक नोटीस सिस्टीम हलवते आपली एक पी आय सिस्टीम हलवते आपल्या आपला एक आरटीआय लोकांना मदत करतो आपण एखादा सल्ला देतो त्या सल्ल्याने बऱ्याच चांगल्या गोष्टी होऊ शकतात एक डॉक्टर एका माणसाला बरं करील पण एक वकील सिस्टीमला बरं करू शकतो किमान एका पोर्शन मध्ये त्यामुळे तुमचा प्रश्न खूप चांगला आहे मी त्या त्या केसच्या पर्टिक्युलर्स मध्ये जात नाही प्रिव्हेंट प्रिव्हेंटिव्ह डिटेक्शनचा प्रश्न होता तो पण ह्या गोष्टी चर्चेला गेल्या पाहिजेत राधर मी दर से हमदर्तकच्या आयोजकांना किंवा कॉलेजच्या आयोजकांना विनंती करेल की एखादा सेशन अशा केसेस वरती पण घ्यावा द अनटोल्ड स्टोरीज ऑर द अनटोल्ड आस्पेक्ट ऑफ अवर इंडियन ज्युडिशियल ओवर टू यू सर थँक्यू थँक्यू सर so who wants to go ahead with a question this will be the last question for the day because we are already crossing the uh, time limit sir my question is i heard this sir, sanction is sanction is uh, brought uh, to the law as a holistic approach for an uh, uh, when um, uh, to avoid a malafide prosecution but that from the inspection you uh, know when the starting also britishers also used for you uh, know to you uh, know determine uh, by partially you uh, know they don't want to um, 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 prosecute the britishers again the today as the political class you uh, know is using that also you uh, know to prosecute the uh, people those who are not supporting so my surprise is that when the court is knowing very well this is only a technical issue and and the, the court is insisting that and uh, this is uh, this is very compulsory when it's only a technical issue post facto sanction is also allowed why the court is taking such a strict action that and uh, the sanction is very important when the court is not considering that issue because sanction is not there the, the injustice is granted that the court is not looking at the issue at all this is a deviation it is a dilution of the justice system in india under this uh, sanction is it correct or not sir you are right this is required uh, mr uh, virend also said earlier that uh, why there should not be an action against the person who has uh, faulted the sanction or obtaining sanction or the cryptic uh, sanction which we know that the court will say that this is not a proper sanction or in any case uh, uh, as he says state of gujarat case which is not implemented there is if there is uh, there are 100 cases investigated by a investigation officer five of them are acquitted 90 uh, sorry five of them are convicted 95 are acquitted and investigation officer is uh, getting promoted 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 so uh, what is the what is the use of this system if that person is not liable if that person is knowing not knowing the uh, knowing his job if that person is investigating a case and that only culminates into an acquittal and there is no benefit of that uh, investigation to the society at all uh, should we uh, i mean the, your your question is right uh, what is today the most as you say that britishers etc if what is today's leading judgment in the money laundering case is pichi dambar mr uh, uh, viren just now said that who is the home minister who delivered speech both in lok sabha and rajya sabha saying that we are bringing a additional safeguard to the to, to the accused which who is required to be protected against the malicious prosecution who is malicious who is malicious who whom we are protecting and the what will courts do courts will have to follow law the makers of law also gives you one leading judgment in the money laundering case prevention of corruption case is also the person who is standing on the floor of the house and delivering the speech that we want to do this and we want to develop the law there we are so ultimately it comes down to us only that we are uh, the person who are voting thank you sir thank you very much uh, just hold on a second hold on a second we are about to close it so i'll just uh, pass on to mr rahul somkamle for a vote of thanks uh, please note after vote on thanks we will be having a, a national anthem and then officially the, the session will come to an end so over to you rahul ah uh, namaskar sir me rahul somkamle you are llb students अच्छा या इम्पॉर्टन्स ऑफ सेक्शन इन क्रिमिनल लॉ दर से हमत हमदर्तक या कार्यक्रमामध्ये मला आभार प्रदर्शन करण्याची संधी दिल्याबद्दल मी प्रथमतः आभार व्यक्त करतो आभाराचे दोन शब्द मी या ठिकाणी बोलत आहे मानू कसे आभार तुमचे खरंच आज कळत नाही मानू कसे आभार तुमचे खरंच आज कळत नाही तुमच्यासाठी तोला मोलाचे शब्द काही मिळत नाही सदैव राहू द्या आशीर्वादाची थाप आमच्या पाठी काळजातले दोन शब्द तुमच्या आभारासाठी आजच्या या महत्वाच्या इम्पॉर्टन्स आपल्या शिक्षणमध्ये 
नवाप्रमाणे प्रावीण्य मिळवलेले प्रवीण फळदेसाई सर हे मल्टी टॅलेंटेड पर्सन आहे त्यांनी विविध क्षेत्रामध्ये प्रावीण्य मिळवलेलं आहे आणि आजचं जे शिक्षण आहे त्याच्यामध्ये त्यांनी विविध माहिती कायदेविषयक माहिती आपल्याला दिली त्याबद्दल सुद्धा त्यांचे या ठिकाणी आम्ही कॉलेजच्या वतीने आभार व्यक्त करतो तसेच ऍडव्होकेट वीरेंद्र इचलकन विघ सर यांनी सुद्धा आर्म ऍक्ट बद्दल माहिती दिली आणि विविध विविध केस लॉ सांगून ज्युडिशियल क्षेत्रामध्ये पोलिसांची भूमिका कशा पद्धतीची असावी आणि तसेच विविध प्रश्नांची उत्तरे सुद्धा त्यांनी व्यवस्थित आम्हाला समजतील असे अशा पद्धतीने दिलेले आहेत तसेच ऍडव्होकेट रवी रवी लोखंडे सर एन जी ओ दरचे आमदारतक या सामाजिक कार्याचे राष्ट्रीय अध्यक्ष यांनी सुद्धा चांगल्या प्रकारे आम्हाला माहिती दिलेली आहे अस्मिता कॉलेज ऑफ लॉ मधील आपले प्रिन्सिपल सर डॉक्टर एस एस गुर्गे सर यांचे सुद्धा या ठिकाणी आभार आजचा जो कार्यक्रम आयोजित केलेला आहे सर आपले केशव तिवारी सर यांचे सुद्धा या ठिकाणी आभार आणि विशाल बक्सळेकर सर यांचे यांचे या ठिकाणी आभार व्यक्त करतो आणि विविध क्षेत्रामधून या कार्यक्रमासाठी जॉईन झालेले सर्व पर्सनचे या ठिकाणी आभार व्यक्त करतो विद्यार्थी विद्यार्थी मित्र मित्रमैत्रिणीचे या ठिकाणी आभार व्यक्त करणार ऑपॉर्च्युनिटी टू द कॉलेज दॅट वी मस्ट हॅव सच सेशन अगेन अँड अगेन इट वॉज रिअली एनलाइटनिंग सेशन अँड एव्हरी स्टुडंट एन्जॉय